today, we're mostly going to talk about motion near L4 and L5. I've mostly focused on the collinear points, but L4 and L5 deserve their day in the sun. In the usual frame, as I represent it, in the rotating frame, we've got the large mass to the left, a smaller mass, the positive x-axis, and then we have L1, which shows up first in terms of energy, and then L2. And then on the other side, L3. And L3, the behavior near L3 is qualitatively the same as L1 and L2. It's a saddle center point. And that means that it has stable direction and unstable direction and a continuum of periodic orbits. It has one periodic orbit per energy, just like L1 and L2, and they're also called Lyapunov orbits. And I think they even move in the same way. So viewed the way we usually view this, they would move in a clockwise way. Because L3 is so far from everything, I just haven't seen it in many you know, mission proposals. It, maybe it'll become useful at some point. But L4 and L5, we usually call those the triangular points because they form a right triangle. And we want to know what's the motion around them. So that's what we're going to do. Similar to how we linearize the dynamics around L1 and L2. So if you remember, we linearize about each point. And I should say what they, where those points are. So I'll say that this is X, E, Y, E. The equilibrium point location is at one half minus mu. And then it's at square root of three over two in terms of y. So we could do plus or minus plus for L4 minus for L5. So that's where they are. Um, being equilibrium points, the velocities are zero at the actual point itself in the four-dimensional phase space. And we could use the approach like we did before where we constructed a matrix you remember it's a constant coefficient matrix. So I'm calling X bar is X E, Y E, X E dot, Y E dot. And both of those are just zero. If you linearized at the Lagrange point itself, then you got a four by four matrix. We're still looking at just the planar problem. These results also hold in the spatial problem. You just get more dynamics because of that third degree of freedom. So when we linearize this, we had 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then the interesting stuff, the negative partial derivatives of the effective potential u bar. So that was negative u x x and the negative u x y 0, 2, negative u x, y, so the mixed partial derivative and then negative u, y, y, negative two, zero. And now we're going to evaluate this at L4 and L5. Um, and then uh, plug in what we know for how to get the eigenvalues. If we go through what we need to, to get the eigenvalues, we, like before, we'll get a biquadratic equation. In this case, the characteristic polynomial, I think is simpler. It's biquadratic like before. That's a property of coming from a Hamiltonian system. And we have a fourth order polynomial because we have a four dimensional phase space. The next term is lambda squared. This is looking pretty easy. And then the last one, 27 over four mu one minus mu. So that's the characteristic equation. And then we could solve this for lambda, actually solve for lambda squared. And we'll get two roots for lambda squared. We'll call those lambda squared plus and minus. And they are negative one half plus or minus one half square root, one minus 27 mu one minus mu. So then you take the square roots of that and you'll get the, uh, you'll get the four eigenvalues. 
Now, what's important here is the thing that we're taking the square root of, if that's real and less than one, then we would have that both lambda plus and lambda minus are negative. All the eigenvalues would be imaginary. And if we look at this, what do we have? So for that term with 27, 27 mu, one minus mu, if that is less than one, then, then the square root is real. And it's also has a value of less than one, which would mean in total, we've got, we have both lambda minus squared and lambda plus squared are negative. So that would mean we have purely imaginary eigenvalues. And sometimes we'll list that a certain way. So we might say plus or minus square root of lambda minus and plus or minus square root lambda plus. And we'll write that as plus or minus i k1 and plus or minus i k2, where k1 and k2 are real. Now, that's only if this condition holds. If that condition doesn't hold, there's going to be some real parts of the eigenvalues. So we'll have eigenvalues in the right half plane. So there's a critical value of mu here, and it would be by solving, uh, solving this, 27 mu, 1 minus mu, uh, minus 1 equals 0. We call it a critical value of mu. And if you solve that, so let's call that mu critical. So mu sub c, it ends up being 27 minus square root, if we're being exact, square root of 621, all divided by 54. And that is approximately 0 0.0385. So for mu less than mu critical, all eigenvalues are imaginary. And that means we have oscillatory motion. For mu greater than that critical value, we have some eigenvalues with a positive real part. And that means unstable motion. And by unstable, we don't mean like it's wobbling or something. It means with respect to the equilibrium point that we care about, an arbitrary displacement from that equilibrium point will have its magnitude grow such that it leaves the vicinity of the equilibrium point. So that's what I mean here by unstable. Unless you pick them very specifically, general initial conditions will leave the vicinity of L4 and L5. Now, this critical value of mu is actually pretty large by solar system standards. So only the, as far as I know, the pluto charon system has a mu that's greater than that. They have a, a mu of about 0.1. So the Earth-Moon system is below this critical value. So L4 and L5 for Earth-Moon system, Sun-Earth system, should, be, should lead to just oscillatory motion. So, so that's good to know. It's sort of instructive to look at how these eigenvalues will change. So I'll be plotting these eigenvalues as a function of mu, just to give you an idea of what's going to happen. So eigenvalues of the linearized dynamics near L4 and L5. Because of symmetry, we can treat them equally. That's why I'm saying L4 and L5. They're, they're going to have the same eigenvalues. So this is showing uh, on the x-axis, I'm giving the log of mu. And on the y-axis, the solid is giving the real part. And the dashed line is giving the imaginary part of the eigenvalues. So before this critical value, which is about here, this is mu c. We see that there's imaginary eigenvalues. It's probably useful to look at the eigenvalue plane. I'm going to do that over here. Something like a root locus plot. If you know what a root locus plot is, that's where you plot how eigenvalues, usually for a control system, how the eigenvalues change as some parameters changed. 
And in a control system, you're thinking of the gain. Here we're thinking of mu. So this is the real axis. Here's the imaginary axis. And before the critical value uh, gets crossed, meaning starting for large values of mu, for large value of mu, you'll have eigenvalues that form a quartet. They may even have some other name like a Klein quartet. It's a set of eigenvalues where, you know, here's one of the eigenvalues and then it's got its complex conjugate. That's what you get for being a real matrix. But then because this, this comes from a Hamiltonian system, it's true that anytime you have an eigenvalue lambda, you will also have the eigenvalue negative lambda. So negative lambda is over here. And now that's another eigenvalue that has a complex conjugate. So there's negative lambda conjugate. So that's called a quartet of eigenvalues. And because we have some things in the right half plane, right, that makes this unstable. So we've got that situation for the case of mu greater than the critical. As mu decreases, I'll draw these curves this way. So as mu were to decrease, everything seems to be going towards the imaginary axis. And then at the critical value itself, these two eigenvalues meet, and so do these on the imaginary axis. And when they meet, that means you've got two sets of imaginary eigenvalues with multiplicity two. And then the eigenvalues move away along the imaginary axis. So that for mu less than critical, now we've got this set of eigenvalues. And this is i k2, here's minus i k2, minus i k1, i k1. So hopefully that explains what this plot is telling us. We have a quartet, um, and when we've got the quartet of eigenvalues, it's L4 and L5 lead to unstable dy dynamics. There, there will be some term that's exponentially growing. Maybe I'll write it this way, e to the alpha t. There'll be something like that in the solution for the linearized dynamics where alpha is positive. So that means something will exponentially grow. Otherwise, you don't have that. You just have oscillatory motion. So we usually just focus on the oscillatory motion since that's the case that holds in any realistic situation we're ever going to look at. You might wonder, well, what's happening to these eigenvalues outside of this, this range? This set, let me color it in yellow. This set, it's, they're, they're just going to kind of asymptote to zero. This set up here will asymptote to one. Going back the other way, these things don't go to, I mean, they go to values, but not really particularly interesting values. If we think of the largest value of mu, that would be mu of 0.5. At mu of 0.5, the real part goes to plus or minus 0.63, and the imaginary part goes to plus or minus 0.95. I think particularly in, in lightning. It is kind of interesting that there is this critical point, though. So, okay, critical value of mu. I don't know what implications that might have for the pluto sharon system. Well, I guess I do. Have you guys heard of the Trojan asteroids? So I think that means there would be no Trojan asteroids in the pluto sharon system. I don't know if you could think of it as the attraction is stronger, kind of the further you are away from this critical value. I think it has more to do with the details of where asteroids formed. So there are these asteroids that were caught around, uh, I, call, I say that they're caught. They do seem to be sort of dynamically caught around L4, and L5 of the Jupiter system. This is a video that was made by NASA. So this is showing the Jupiter system and we're in the Jupiter rotating frame. So Jupiter appears still and you can see sort of a cluster of things ahead of Jupiter in, in its orbit. That's on the right side, that's L4 and also behind Jupiter, that's L5. I think sometimes people have started giving names to the L4 asteroids as the Trojans and the L5 ones as the Greek asteroids, but I'm not exactly sure, just to, just to be different. And then there's, there's a mission that's going to go to visit these. So if you look at up there, 
the years are just flying by because it takes a while to get out there. And then someone had to design this so that it could visit as many of these Trojan asteroids as possible and maybe some other asteroids along the way. And again, this is viewed in the rotating frame because it's just the natural frame to do a mission like this. So this is the Lucy mission. And it looks like it's taking quite a while. If you saw from that other video, some of these Trojan asteroids have a pretty significant out-of-plane component. So even if you add the third dimension, L4 and L5 for this value of mu, which is about one over a thousand, is still going to be stable. So the sort of the main feature is that there could be natural objects there. In fact, I think it's believed there are natural objects around L4 and L5 for the Sun-Earth system. It's just that the um, they're hard to see, but as our detection techniques get better, we might find more and more of them. There's sort of a nice approximation for lambda. This is an approximation of the eigenvalues for small mu. We have that, I'll write it this way, lambda one and two are roughly equal to imaginary and then square root one minus 27 over four times mu. So you can sort of see that as mu goes to zero, this is just going to go to um, one. I should write a plus or minus out in front there. These squiggles mean approximate. So that's one pair. And then the other pair will go to approximately uh, plus or minus i square root 27 over 4 times mu. So in the limit, that seems to go to zero. Now, because these are purely imaginary, it means that there's going to be some corresponding oscillatory motion. But the oscillatory motion will have two different frequencies. So motion near L4 and L5 uh, will be oscillatory with two frequencies. There'll be a large frequency and then a smaller frequency. We've got the two frequencies and also corresponding two periods. I sort of like thinking of things in terms of periods. It's easier for me. So two pi over, say, magnitude of lambda one and two. That's the large period. So small frequency. And then two pi over magnitude lambda three, four. That's the large period, low frequency. I should probably say that again. So this is the, it's the low frequency. Uh, and then this is high frequency, high period motion and low period. There are some complications that can arise if these two have some kind of ratio that's close to a rational number, close to a significant rational number, but let's ignore that for now. What we could do is say that the resulting motion of the particle, of any particle near L4 or L5, is gonna be composed of two different motions. So there'll be a, a short period motion with that period two pi over lambda one, two. So this period is actually gonna be pretty close to the orbital period of the primaries, especially as mu gets very, very small. That frequency will be just plus or minus one. So we've got that short period motion, and then we'll also have a superimposed longer period motion with uh, the period two pi over lambda three, four. And this longer period motion is sometimes called libration. And we say there's libration about the equilibrium point. In fact, all of these points, L1 through L5, are sometimes called libration points because it is possible to find motion where you just sort of circulate around them. We can actually visually depict it in sort of an interesting way as an epicyclic motion. We get epicyclic motion. That means cycles within cycles. 
which is just sort of what I was describing anyway. So we've got the epicyclic motion, which is the small ellipse, this thing, and the motion of the epicenter, which is the large ellipse, or I might call it a guiding center. So this big red dot there. That dot is going to go around with the long period motion. So the longer time scale. And then the shorter time scale is the smaller ellipse. You can even think of what the ratio of the semi major axis is of these ellipses. So let me sketch here this larger ellipse. And I'm just showing L4 here. And you can sort of see how there's this tilt by 30 degrees. That's just how it is. It partly because the uh, circle of the orbit, the circle of the orbit that uh, M2 going around M M1 is sort of in the direction of this semi-major axis of the larger ellipse. And the larger ellipse has a ratio of the semi-minor and semi-major axes, B and semi-major axes. Uh, which are B over A is roughly equal to three mu raised to the one half. So this would be B and then this longer direction is A. The other one is an ellipse where the ratio is very close to two to one, two to one. And if we were to view what the motion looks like, right, we could, we, we know enough about writing solutions of linear ODEs. You could actually write it out analytically, but let me show you what it looks like. So that's sort of what the motion looks like for a particular initial condition. This was an initial condition picked, just displaced a little bit away from the equilibrium point. As you have these two different frequencies, you can see the path of the guiding center and then the path with respect to the guiding center leads to these sort of loop-de-loops. But this is, this is what you would see. So this is a trajectory in the rotating frame of a particle vibrating around L4. So that's the type of motion you expect very close to L4 and uh, L5. This particular initial condition was started at zero velocity. And if you remember, there were zero velocity curves and when you've got, when you start at uh, an initial condition that's zero velocity, then you're basically starting on the zero velocity curve. And this magenta line here is showing the zero velocity curve for an energy that's really close to the energy of L4. If we go to an energy above that of L4, the zero velocity curves disappear entirely. For slightly larger values, maybe you remember, right, we had, um, we had these sort of weird tadpole shaped looking things kind of going around L4 and L5. That was the forbidden region. This is M1 and M2. But as you go to larger and larger energies, that kind of exclusion region, the forbidden region shrinks and disappears. The type of motion that can kind of be described by sort of extending this analysis out further are some trajectories that are very weird looking, especially in the inertial frame, but also in, in the rotating frame that are called tadpoles and horseshoes. And let me just show some of those to you. They're really only valid kind of near L4 and L5, but they're, they're, they're real things out there. So we have tadpoles and horseshoes and they're named that way because of their appearance. So these are a couple of different tadpole orbits, and they're called that because they kind of look like a tadpole, not very much, but this is L4. This says mu1 and mu2, it means M1 and M2. The mu here is about that of Jupiter. So very similar to Jupiter, meaning these are kind of the orbits that those Trojan asteroids would be on. So these are Trojan-like trajectories. These, however, did start, I think, with the velocity very close to zero and with a position very close to L4. And then they just sort of go around and you can kind of see what's, what's going on. It looks similar to the idea of that 
there's a guiding center. And then with respect to that guiding center, there's this other high frequency motion. And these are just two different in initial conditions. You can see the elongation seems to be more in this direction than in this other direction. So this is the direction, this longer direction is the direction in which that's the direction of the orbit, at least for this case. But there's also tadpoles around L5. So I'm just showing some tadpole orbits around L4, but they're also around L5. Just keep that in mind. And a three-dimensional version of this is what those Trojan asteroids are doing. Like maybe it's worth seeing those Trojan asteroids again. I think I had a picture of them. It's it, the Jupiter system is the one where we've seen them the most. And so it's thought that uh, maybe that means something about the Jupiter system. I don't know. Uh, that's uh, I guess an interesting planetary science question, but it's thought that these are planetesimals left over from the formation of the solar system that are somehow in a more pristine condition than those in the rest of the asteroid belt because they've been dynamically protected. They must be large enough that we could see them. I actually don't know the size range of, of these, but if you can detect something out at the distance of Jupiter and it's a dark piece of rock, it must be pretty big. But you can see this, the, the Z extent is not trivial. And so these are almost all on like some kind of weird tadpole-like orbit. There seem to be some strange outliers. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe they're slowly escaping. Maybe these things can get captured. I don't know. Um, I don't know the mechanism by which they would get captured unless they can do a delta V. And the only way to do a delta V is to hit something when you're out in space. So if something came in and hit an asteroid, then maybe it loses enough energy to kind of get caught in this. But most of these were just sort of born here when the solar system formed. That's the idea. I'll say more about tadpoles in a minute. First, let me. You might wonder, well, what happens if you just keep extending this and extend it till it gets to like L3? That's sort of the largest tadpole you could have. The largest tadpole would be something that kind of goes to L3. And then on the other end, it gets pretty close to M2. Basically enters that hill radius around M2. So those are the largest tadpoles. If you look for initial conditions that lead to some motion that goes beyond L3, you can do that and you get things that look like two tadpoles connected or because it seems to resemble a letter C or a horseshoe, they've been called horseshoe orbits. So let me show you horseshoe. Here's some horseshoe orbits. So the one on the left is sort of a generic horseshoe. It just, it keeps on going. And so the trajectory starts maybe from one side. It's hard to see where anything began here, but right, this sort of goes around and comes back here and goes around there. It seems to surround L4 and L5, but also L3. L3 is somewhere over here. And again, it comes kind of within, touches the edge of this sphere of influence, but it's more of a three body problem sphere of influence that we call the Hills region or Hill sphere around the smaller mass. It's possible to pick initial conditions where you can kind of minimize that epicycle type motion. And that's where you, where you get things like this on the left. There is some kind of characteristic period for these that's related to the period of the orbital bodies, but I, I can't recall what it is right now. But they do have some characteristic period. It's pretty long. Let me show a video that shows these. So we're looking at a horseshoe orbit in the rotating frame on the right, and then and an inertial frame on the left. So you can kind of see what's happening. It has this close encounter. It seems to like scoot to the outside. When it's on the outside, it goes clockwise. Then it has another close encounter. Now it's on the inside of the orbit of the planet. It's going counterclockwise. And it'll just keep doing this forever and ever. And then you can look at it in the inertial frame. And it looks like one is sort of catching up to the other and perturbing it. it seems to perturb it in a pretty odd way. But this is a solution of the three-body problem, and maybe it'll find some use. I don't know. Let me show the time history. This is the time history of one of those horseshoe orbits that I showed. And this is using the semi-major axis in the, in the normalized system. So A equals 1 is the orbit of uh, the secondary around the primary. 
So you could see it goes outside and then inside and then outside and inside. Anytime you have a large change, so a large delta A, that means there was a close encounter. And those also coincide with these spikes in eccentricity. If you were to treat the horseshoe orbit as if it was a Keplerian orbit around the primary mass, this is what you would calculate. And you go, huh, kind of interesting. I don't know why there's all those oscillations in eccentricity near zero. I don't know what's going on with that. But let me finish up with some interesting way to analyze these orbits. We can view, classify orbits in an R theta plane. So using polar coordinates, basically. Using polar coordinates in the rotating frame. This is M1. We've got our center of mass, the very center, and then M2. And here's a point, particle P. We've got R1. That's the distance to mass M1. R2 is the distance to mass M2. And then R is the distance from the center of mass. You know, there's still this x-axis here, and here's the y-axis. I'm going to use R and theta. Use R and theta instead of x and y, which is something you can easily do if you view this in a Lagrangian sense, where you get to pick which variables you want to describe the position of the particle. So you could use Cartesian, x, y, or you could use R and theta. If you use R and theta, then you get different equations of motion. So this is writing the equations of motion. This is negative partial U bar partial R. So that would be the radial equation. Um, in case I refer to these, maybe I'll call this one. And then there is the tangential motion equation. So we get R theta double dot plus two. 2r dot theta dot plus 2r dot equals negative 1 over r partial u bar partial theta. So often these aren't used for computations if we were to integrate this numerically, but you can do this. You can write u bar, u bar, you could write it in terms of r and theta. And it'll be the same thing. You'll just have to write R1 and R2 in terms of R and theta, which is possible. I don't want to go through all the steps that we'll need to do this. One half, the nice thing is there's an R squared that shows up. R1 squared is, if you use the law of cosines, you get mu squared plus R squared plus 2 mu R cosine theta. R2 squared equals one minus mu squared plus r squared minus two, one minus mu r cosine theta. This distance is mu, this distance is one minus mu. That basically does it for you. Then you can take the partial derivatives as need be. For looking at tadpole and horseshoe orbits, we're gonna make some simplifying assumptions. Let r equal one plus, I'll call it delta, where the magnitude of delta is small. So we're saying the radial motion, we're only going to look at motion that's close to the radius of one. And so the tadpole and horseshoe orbits, because they seem to sort of hug the orbit of M2, they are going to have a radius close to one. We'll be looking at the case of mu, very small as well. So we could look at dynamics in terms of delta and kind of go from there. So you could rewrite R1 and R2 in terms of delta. There's something else that we can do. There's a simple relationship between theta dot, so the angular rate of motion as viewed in the rotating frame, uh, and delta. And the way that we can get that is starting from Kepler's law in terms of what the periods are. So for our problem, we've got the G times the mass 
of the two things, M1 plus M2, that is one. And so Kepler's law for the particle is, I'll write it this way, N squared A cubed is equal to one. But we'll say that A is very similar to R. A is one plus delta and N, that's the, that's the rate viewed in the inertial frame. That'll be one due to just the motion of the rotating frame. And then any deviation from that will be theta dot. Remember theta dot, this is the angular velocity in the rotating frame. N is the angular velocity in the inertial frame. And now there's an important Taylor series expansion that if you haven't seen it, um, you should know it. It's that if you've got one plus epsilon, where epsilon is small, and that's raised to any power, doesn't have to be an integer, the leading term will be one, and then the next term will be k times epsilon. And then the next term will, over will be, this O means order, it's order epsilon squared. So if you have something really small, in this case, we're gonna assume that we've already got that magnitude of delta is really small. We're gonna assume that magnitude of this angular velocities viewed in the rotating frame is pretty small, which it's something that you could view numerically when you see these horseshoe orbits. Theta dot is small. It is less than one, quite a bit less than one. So N squared A cubed would be one plus theta dot squared, and then one plus delta to the third. Using that Taylor series expansion, this becomes one plus two theta dot, and then we have one plus three delta. And of course that equals one. If we were do this multiplication here, we'll get one plus two theta dot plus three delta plus, and I'll just say terms that are of order two and higher, right? We've got delta and theta dot are both small. So if you multiply two small things, you have something that's very small and therefore ignorable. This equals one. So the ones cancel and we're left with this result where negative two theta dot equals three delta. So there's a relationship between that angular rate and the deviation of the radius from one. If we use this along with the second equation up here, this one, I guess I should say you would get that same relationship if you basically made the same kinds of approximations, delta small, theta dot small, and tried equation one. It's as if we're ignoring short time scales. We're only looking at large time scales. So we're effectively assuming that our double dot is zero. It's so small that that doesn't even matter. So equation two, the I guess you could solve, say the azimuthal or angular equation gives theta double dot plus two delta dot equals mu negative mu partial derivative with respect to theta of negative one over two sine theta over two and then plus cosine theta, which you could do some manipulations and this becomes uh, something else. This will become, you pick up a factor of negative mu over two minus that and plus, let me put parentheses around that, plus four sine squared theta over two. And then since we have an equation here that relates delta and theta dot, you could take a derivative of that because here, what is delta dot? Delta dot is negative two thirds theta double dot. So you can get an equation that's completely in terms of theta dot and it's even of a form where you could integrate it. Left-hand side here will be what? Negative one third theta double dot. When you have an equation that looks like that, I don't know if you've seen this before. So we could rewrite as it'll look like theta double dot equals the negative of some potential V for theta. 
any time you have an equation that's of that form, you know that one half theta dot squared plus that function of theta is a constant. It's something that happens in one degree of freedom systems. And by making approximations here, we've effectively made the theta dynamics a one degree of freedom system. So we have, this would be the ODE, second order ODE. And there's this corresponding thing that looks kind of like energy. And the constant, the constant just depends on what the initial conditions were. Constant from initial conditions. We could write things this way, or now we would sub back in relationship between theta dot and delta. The thing that we'll finally get is that delta squared plus four thirds mu times one over sine theta over two plus four sine squared theta over two equals that constant. Maybe this doesn't look too significant, but if you plot contours of this in the, you could either do theta and delta, or you could do theta and R, just knowing that R is equal to one plus delta. You can get closed curves. We can use this to approximate tadpole and horseshoes, horseshoe orbits. So let me show you some examples of that. So here I'm just, instead of the R axis, I'm calling this A, because it's a little bit easier to understand. I'm writing the angle theta in terms of degrees and re remember what that is. Maybe we just draw M1 and M2. And we're looking at basically things that are close to this circle of radius one. Particle is at some location where this distance above one is delta and that angle is theta, measured the usual way. So this initial condition that goes, and it's we're showing it here starting near L3, and then it goes, goes around. This is something that you would get from this expression up here. It looks like a simple phase plane. In fact, it looks like a duffing system, kind of. But this would be a horseshoe. In fact, it's the horseshoe that I showed earlier. If I zoom on up here, this horseshoe, just think of uh, like at this point, we were at some radial distance, but we'll define that as one plus delta. And delta could be negative, right? And then at this angle theta. So of course it's gonna be double valued in theta because it will also be over there on that side. So that orbit looks like, if you plot it in terms of, you could think of A, A is just, it's just the same as R. I'm not, it's, I'm not doing anything fancy here. This is R. And it's also equal to one plus delta. And that's what we're really using. That's why everything is going through one up here. So we're also showing the locations of L4 and L5 in terms of their angles, right? L4 is at an angle 60 degrees ahead. Uh, the reason we're going from 0 to 360 and not negative 180 to 180 is so that these sine theta over 2s don't give us any problems. <laughs> uh, so we're just sticking with 0 to 360. So that's L4 and L5. And then L3 is, of course, right? It's um, going back to this diagram here. So we've got L4, L5, and this is L3. So that's a horseshoe orbit, and it, and it circles both. Something that's just going around L4, like this blue initial condition, and then it's just sort of going around that way. That's a small tadpole. And then this other one, uh, maybe I'll do that green. It's a large tadpole. So over here, we would have, if I were to try to sketch all of these, yeah, blue would be a small tadpole. Green is a, a larger tadpole. And red is a horseshoe. Whoa, there we go. And it includes L3. Yeah. And you'll notice these look a lot like zero velocity curves. They do seem to kind of hug zero velocity curves. In fact, there, there might be a way to try to describe the dynamics in the three body system in the rotating frame by looking at distance to the zero velocity curve. It might be an interesting thing to look at. Anyway, 
hopefully this was helpful just to give an idea of other types of orbits and kind of complete the picture of what the linear dynamics are near equilibrium points and then some of this extra stuff. This analysis that does the polar coordinates, this isn't from my book. I actually found this in a book. It was a planetary science class book it's called Solar System Dynamics by Murray and Dermott. If you're curious, this is from chapter three of that, where they talk about the three-body problem. And well, they they didn't even do this analysis. This was some additional fun stuff I did. They did go through the linear theory though. And you could try, you've got the code now, you could try initial conditions and mess with these horseshoe orbits if you want. And I think that's it. Any comments, thoughts? Dr. Ross, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. In, uh, in a future lecture, are you going to talk about out of plane motion with these, or is it um, either not interesting or not relevant for some reason? I'll talk about out of plane motion near L1 and L2, but probably not not in this regime. It's it's usually considered that when you're away from the masses, that z direction is basically simple harmonic motion. But that, I mean, that's not always true. It is it is non-linearly coupled to other things, but you can almost treat it as simple harmonic motion. Okay, so more on the less interesting side. Yeah. Okay. But it, I mean, near L1, you need that to get halo orbits. Halo orbits uh, sort of emerge as another bifurcation as you look at larger uh, Lyapunov orbits. So out of the Lyapunov orbits grows these this some, this two families of halo orbits and then other orbits. In fact, I don't even think all of the. It's definitely the case that the all the orbits in three body problem have have not been classified. I don't even know if all the orbits around L1 and L2 have been classified because as you go to larger and larger energies, other things can happen, especially in that third dimension. So I'll talk about that with halo orbits. So I'm going to get back to the stuff related Thank to uh, Lagrange points probably next next week. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe or just wait and watch the next video in the series.